So in the last lesson, we looked at the field strength E as being equal to the force per unit charge. So now we're going to ask so the question, how do we work out this force? How do we quantify and calculate the electrostatic force? We've come across the electrostatic force by looking at the interaction of like and different charges. We know that they repel and that they attract depending on their specific charge. We can calculate the force using something called Coulomb's law. Now this crazy looking formula is Coulomb's law. Firstly, we need to remind ourselves that just like electric field, the electrostatic force is a vector. That means it has a direction. Its units are newtons, just like any other force. And the relationship between force it follows something called an inverse square relationship. That means that force is inversely proportional to the distance squared. Now what distance are we talking about? We're first considering the distance between two point charges. Let's not worry about whether they're positive or negative, whether they're attracting or repelling. We're just going to worry about the values. So force is inversely proportional to the distance between the charges squared. And that's called an inverse squared relationship. Do you remember the last inverse square relationship you came across? You came across one when you were looking at intensity of light over distance. So let's get back to Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law states that the force between charges is proportional to the charge on each of the charges and inversely proportional to the distance squared. The constant in the relationship is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught and that is the permittivity of free space. It's a description of a material um, and its ability to carry charge but we tend to assume that it's in a vacuum and so therefore we always use the same value 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12. Coulomb's law only works for point charges with radial electric fields. And luckily, I would say that almost all, if not 100% of all exam questions, relate to this kind of charge. Just a note about the permittivity of free space, this little constant here. If the charges are not in empty space, that means in air or in a dielectric material, that means an insulating material like a polythene or um, any other polymer, then the force between the charges will differ because this number will change. Now how do we deal with that in questions? Well you just have to be really careful. If they give you a different value of epsilon naught, the permittivity, you'll have to adjust your calculation to that. Luckily, most calculations are carried out in free space. So this means that we can, we can generalize. You could divide 1 by 4 pi in the permittivity of free space every time you do the question. Or we can use something called the electric constant, 8.99 times 10 to the 9. This is also in the data booklet. So you could, as long as they don't change the material that they're doing the question in, you can generalize and just use this as 1 over 4 pi permittivity. A more generalized version of the formula then would be force equals 8.99 times 10 to the 9 q1 q2 over r squared. Now the only issue we could have with this kind of question then is the sign convention. We have um, a vector, which is a force, so therefore we need to consider signs and direction. Now here we have two charges acting um, towards each other because they are attracting. You need to calculate the force between them. 
use Coulomb's law and the Coulomb's law formula to calculate this and then check your answers. Okay? So, hopefully, using your generalized formula, you plugged in your values for Q1 and Q2 and you saw that they were attracting, so you've got a plus 1.96 times 10 to the 40 newtons. So there's a simple question. Let's try a different one. Now this question really challenges your idea of how to deal with vectors. This time we have three, one, two, three charges, and they're acting at 90 degrees to each other. Now before you use your generalized formula, I want you to remember how you dealt with these kinds of forces in the first topic last year. Remember that when you have two forces acting at 90 degrees to each other, the resultant force is worked out by using uh, Pythagoras. Here, this would give you a resultant value of the two forces that are acting at 90 degrees to each other. Have a go at this question. Stop the video and then check your answers. So this was a two-step question. If we look at the interaction between these two charges, we can see that they are attracting. So we work out the final value, 3 times 10 to the minus 9, 8 times 10 to the minus 9, and we have a positive value of 0 0.008863 newtons. Now what direction is this acting on? The charge that is in common for both situations is this, the 3 nanocoulomb charge. You pretty much have to dig deep into your grade 11 memory and remember that what you're looking at is a free body diagram. This charge has a force that is attracting towards the minus in this direction. If your freed body diagram was about this charge, then the direction would be that way. Okay, but then that's not relevant because we need to consider the other force. This charge is pulling down the positive charge as well. So you have another force acting at 90 degrees. What is the size of that force? It's here. You've worked it out using Coulomb's law. Now they're at 90 degrees to each other, you would use Pythagoras to work out what the resultant force is and the direction it's working at. It's very common to find questions which mix Coulomb's law and resolving forces. So you might need to do a little bit of revision from last year's work.